welcome to the GoTo Podcast. Each episode covers the brightest and boldest ideas from the world's leading experts in software development. Tune in for practical lessons, compelling theories, and plenty of inspiration. GoTo gathers the brightest minds in the software community to help developers tackle projects today, plan for tomorrow, and create a better future. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in cities like Amsterdam, London, Copenhagen, and Chicago, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. Hi there. Welcome to another episode of GoTo Unscripted. Um, We're here at GoTo Amsterdam. I'm Adrian Mott. I'm a technical community advocate at ChainGuard, where we do stuff around securing the software supply chain. And I'm here with Matt Turner from Tetrate. Hi, yeah, I'm Matt Turner. I'm a software engineer at Tetrate. We help enterprises with service mesh and zero trust and you know, high compliance uh, network security. So thanks, thanks for having me. You're welcome. Um, so I believe yesterday you gave a talk on building images with ChainGuard tooling. I did, ironically, given that, yeah, you work there and I don't, but, uh, but yeah. Could you give us a bit of an overview of what you talked about? Yeah, sure. So I talked about um, how folks can use the new ChainGuard tooling to, as an alternative to, to Docker file builds, essentially. Like I know, you know, the, the company angle on this is, is probably all to do with security and whatever, but for me, I, I presented quite a practical uh, of using a Docker file. This is how you might change over. And I did, you know, talk about the, the advantages. Um, but yeah, I talked about how you can get smaller images, talked about how you automatically get S-bombs, soft, software builds of material uh, and signing um, and show folks you know, how to build their own application into an APK package and then how to take that APK and a few others from, from your Wolfie distribution uh, and turn those into a, you know, a container image in a, in a declarative, you know, sort of code first kind of way. No, that's amazing. Um, I, like you said, I, I worked in some of these tools in the early days, and so I find it amazing that you're talking about it um, before even I am. Um, you talked uh, about a few of the advantages there. Is there any in particular that sort of attracted you to it in the first place? It's funny just uh, that I was talking about it because I sent, um, you know, Brevin at uh, Trifork a, a list of things that I could talk about, and most of them were to do with my job, right, about service meshes and networking and stuff. Um, but I had just moved some of our images, uh, you know, at Tetrate over to the Ch- Chain Guard tooling. So I was like, oh, I, you know, I have, I know this stuff backwards at the moment. I guess I could talk about that. It was like the fifth bullet point in my list. And he was like, that one sounds interesting. Um, so, sorry, what was the question? What attracted me? Yeah. I was actually trying to reduce image sizes. Again, I know security is like the big topic. I was actually trying to get some smaller images. Um, we do a lot of Golang tooling, as you might imagine. And I was actually running a Kubernetes operator uh, in Rust. I think I love Rust and the, the, the Kubernetes crate in Rust is like really ergonomic, really nice to write controllers. So I'd written that and both of those are um, st- or like to be static languages, but Golang is not, you know, Golang tries to compile statically, but it doesn't always manage and it can be a bit tricky. So I was having all the usual build and link time problems. And the obvious answer is to just throw the kitchen sink at it to either, you know, just ship your Golang code in the Golang base image, which is meant to be a build image, or you end up, you know, trying to mess around with getting the correct version of libc in all the right places. So honestly, I just wanted the control because I was trying to reduce that container image size because it was taking too long to load into all of our clusters. Okay. Um, I'm guessing you've also played with the, the Google Distillus images and yes. KO then? Yeah, I've, I've used KO sort of once and I've heard about Jib in the Java world. I didn't really... They're not bad tools. I didn't like the approach i think it felt like the wrong thing and it felt like i'd have to we felt maybe like a bit of a fad a bit of a reaction to the way that some of the other tools are getting quite clunky um i felt like i'd have to to retool fairly soon and obviously for, for other languages i was trying to use some rust as well yeah. the digital systems just yeah they're a nice idea they were certainly a lot better than than what we had you know scratch is ideal if you can persuade yeah. your your system to do a perfectly static build which i've actually written a blog post about Shameless plug, I guess, on, on Go, because actually I didn't really understand that until I dived into it one day. Yeah. But with Scratch, you actually miss, you can't just throw a binary into Scratch because you miss time zone data, you miss CA certs, you miss all these little things. Even if you don't need a shell, even if you don't need a libc, you do need usually that kind of stuff hanging around to, to do anything. Um, so yeah, 
yeah, sorry, long answer. I have used digital list, but it was another thing putting that tool together. There's actually more than one digital list. There's about eight. And they That's all right. have this static and there's base and there's CC and there's other stuff. And they, it's one of those things like um, the Kubernetes network policy where default is not the default. Uh, base is, no, um, yeah, base is not the smallest distro list. You might think it is, but uh, base is actually built on static. So anyway, that was a little confusing. So that was something I had to get my head around for the talk. But again, day to day, it's the kind of thing I, I totally make a mistake with. So I, I really like uh, the way that you just spell things out with with AppCo. Okay, that's great to hear. Um, is there anything particularly difficult or confusing you find in our images or our tooling rather? Not particularly. Uh, the Wolfie distribution didn't have ARM64 um, images available until recently, but now they are, so that's that's great. Um, no, I think it all makes sense. There's a few quality of life improvements. I've yeah. Uh, I've sort of tweeted about like um, you always have to you you have to add any any non root users that you want and you almost always want them so I you know all my files have like the same copy pasted sort of seven line standard for that but no other than little quality of life things I think it's uh, I think it's all fairly good yeah I mean from my point of view we're always working on docs because yeah I would really like our docs to be super great for people getting started so that's in the works um. So on a slightly different subject, um, you work at Tetrate, and I'm curious if you see any similarities between creating secure container images and securing networks. Right, so that's interesting, because I think it is a bit of a mindset shift. I'm going to say zero trust, and I maybe won't say it too often, because it's such a buzzword, but if you put that in the title of the video, you probably get some probably get some uh, search traffic. Um, but yeah, I think it's a similar mindset, because what is zero trust? mean it doesn't actually mean trust nothing right because that would be you then you'd never make a network call or you'd never be able to include any any software dependencies you've got to know what you're trusting and trust the right set of things and not trust anything more and have strong trust for the things that you're trying that you're going to trust right so if i'm building a piece of software i need to know which packages are included in that and i need to you know be able to verify by signature or whatever that that information is correct and then I need to know whether I can trust them. So maybe I build an image using the chain guard tooling and then six months later, you know, it's been sat around in my registry. I try to run it. That's when something like Caverno can come along and say, right, I know what's in this and I trust that. I know what I'm being, you know, I trust that manifest. I know what it is. I know which dependencies it is that I'm being asked to trust. With the benefit of six months worth of security research, let me now go check the CVE database and see if any of these are vulnerable. Because the build may have gone through because there were no known vulnerabilities at the time. But if that thing's gone a bit stale, and we've all got those in our registries, you know, six months later, okay, are there any CVEs in this? So I know what I'm trusting and I can have a high level of trust in it because we've generated that SBOM with trusted tooling and we've signed it to know that it's not been tampered with. And I think you see the same thing on a network. A zero trust network isn't trust nothing. It's just don't trust things by which subnet they're on, you know, which IP they claim to come from. It's get strong authentication, like like a spiffy ID, you know, like an X509 certificate or like a JWT for the end user or, or both. Um, and then, you know, have an access control list. Ideally block everything, you know, allow lists what you want. So, you know, trust the minimal set of things with a minimal allow list. Know what it is that you're trusting through strong identities. So I think they're actually very similar. And I, I did do a talk once on, on kind of both. Like, you know, it was for a general software engineering conference. And I was like, right, if you're in the cloud, you just moved to Kubernetes or ECS or something and you want to start locking things down, you know, are you completely confused by all of the buzzwords and, and marketing, frankly, around zero trust? Okay, here's what you do on the compute side of things. And I you know, talked about your stuff and starting to get stronger trust in the supply chain. And then on the network side of things, you know, just did a sort of demystify of... Uh, of zero trust on the network. Okay, I think that's an excellent answer. Um, I guess it comes down to being explicit and concrete, um, both in terms of what you trust in the image and what you trust in the network. Is that fair? Yeah, I, th I think so. Um, so certainly on the network, you know, we when I when I talk to our users, there's I've got like five bullet points that I use to like what actually is zero trust. Um, well, okay, so stepping back, you know, zero trust is about uh, you know identity-based authentication and uh, you know shrinking trust boundaries and stuff. Uh, but like, how do I actually implement it? 
I think you've got five things. I, need, I think you need encryption on the wire right between services. And the way you set that up is with this mutual TLS, with a certificate exchange. Um, so once you've done that, you've also got number two, which is like workload authentication. Do I know the ID of the machine I'm talking to? It's probably another pod, but it might be a VM or it might be a cloud you know, managed service. So can I authenticate the workload that I'm talking to? As in, can I know who it is? Can I authorize it? As in, should it be talking to me? Should I allow it to talk? Once, once I know, once I've set up the encryption, I can do the authentication. Once I've done the authentication, I can make that auth Z decision about whether it should talk to me. And then the final two are the, uh, the same for end users. So can I authenticate an end user? Because if I'm the, you know, the microservice that fronts the, you know, the orders database, it's no good saying, well, yeah, the basket microservice is allowed to talk to me. Like, okay, sure it is. Under, you know, it's not blocked completely. It has got some reason to do it. But as the orders server, I shouldn't be uh, giving, uh, you know, me your your orders, right? So I need you need that end user context all the way through. You should be forwarding those headers like you forward trace headers, so that you've always got that context in which to make an access control decision. So yeah, authentication of knowing who the end user is, and then you can do the obvious corollary. The fifth one, which is authorization of an end user, so for any request, even deep into a backend, you know, graph of microservices. We're still saying, oh, who is the user and do they, you know, should this Google Cloud bucket be giving, you know, the Gmail service any data? Yes, oh, but it's Matt that's logged in. Don't give them agents emails, right? So I think, yeah, so that's how we try to be concrete about what does zero trust mean on a network. And I, but I think you're, you're right in more general terms, right? It's, it's about being very explicit about what it is you trust. And if you look at like an, an app code file, it's, you know, it's, it's really as simple as here's the key ring you know, for the public signatures I accept uh, for my packages. Here's the list of packages I want. Nothing else should be in there. And that's all because it uses APK. That's all declarative, right? Nobody can sneak some more files on disk with a, like a, a post install hook script in like a you know, Debian package because APK just doesn't support that. Okay, that's great. Um, well, thank you very much, Matt. Thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. Head over to gotopia.tech to discover lots more content from the brightest minds in software development.